Welcome to What Do You Want To Do, the show that will hopefully help you figure out what you want to do in life or reconnect you to what you love doing. Each show has a guest who is doing what they want to do, whether it's in their career or in addition to their regular job. Most importantly, we want to help you realize that no matter your age, you too can do what you want to do if you have the will to do it. Now here's your host, Leonard Kaplan. Hi, and welcome to another edition of What Do You Want to Do? Actually, another season of What Do You Want to Do? I'm going to stop making shows again because my teaching job has come to a close for the summer, and I'm ready to have time to do the fun stuff in life, like make this show. So today's guest is a really successful person who has created her own Amazon series. Her name is Jamie Denbo. I met her when she was a student at Swampscott High School back in the day where she went. And she has become a successful actress and creator of the show you can find on Amazon.com called American Princess which is about a bride that is cheated on by her fiancé and goes to live at a Renaissance fair, of all things. Quite a premise, very funny show, excellent acting, and let's go to that right now. Welcome, Jamie Dembo, to What Do You Want to Do? And I'm thrilled that you're here. It is an honor to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And I remember you from many moons ago in the <laughs> town of Swampscott when I used to work there. Yes, I I was just there actually recently visiting my parents who live uh, in the same house I grew up in. So I was just in, awesome. in Swampscott. It's very hard for me to not slip into my Boston accent when I listen to you. <laughs> I, it's so there could be some some slippage over the course of this interview. I'm just warning anyone who's listening. I, I won't tell the casting directors or anybody like that. <laughs> I promise. Because I don't All know that. any. <laughs> well, and hilariously, when I am cast in things, which is very rare these days, I am often cast as a Bostonian. So oh, that's um, interesting. It does happen naturally. But anyway, continue. I interrupt. You. All right. So now you are married to John Ross Bowie. I am married to John Ross Bowie. People say Bowie. They say Bowie. They say Bowie if you're in the South. That is why I did not take the name. Well, Too many will, problems. They will say Kripke, as his character was on they often the Big say Bang Kripke. Theory. Yes, that is true. So I'm, I'm just going to ask you one question about him, and then it's all you. All right? Please. It's, I'm thrilled to talk about him. When he came up with the voice, did he use Elmer Fudd as a model? Absolutely, yes. He stole that right from the cartoons. Um, he did. In fact, he, I've heard, it's so funny. I've heard him tell the story and then I think I forgot the story, but he initially went in just talking with a completely not normal voice um, or typical voice. And then they, I think, asked for some kind of speech impediment. And I can't remember if he self-selected the Elmer Fudd thing or if that just was... Actually, if they said sort of like, a, you know, like a little bit of a I forget what the actual um, condition is, dis is called, but he 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 wound up doing it for them like that in the audition second. You know what I mean? So it wasn't the initial thing to come out of his mouth. Very cool. So let's yeah. get back to you. You started <laughs> in Swampscott, Mass, growing up in, in a typical Jewish family. I read yes. the article. Oh, yeah. Uh <laughs> go, go, go Wikipedia. And uh, well, this wasn't on Wikipedia. It was an actual article, I ah, believe, that, okay. that, that I saw. And it says that you came from a very strict Jewish background. I'm Jewish, but my background is not strict religiously. How did this affect maybe what you did later on here? You know, it's funny because it, I, you know, I'm, I've seen references to that. And I actually myself really was, I grew up conservative, but mm -hmm. my parents had grown up in very, orthodox and much more restrictive homes. Mm -hmm. What happened was, is that when I was little, we sort of, we sampled from all different things and we tended to go back and forth quite a bit. So when I was in a uh, religious school, I went to Hillel Academy for uh, elementary school. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, we were definitely, I was almost more observant than my parents. And then somehow when I left the school and started going to the public schools, my parents got more religious. So we've we've really flip-flopped many times. So what mm -hmm. it has created for me is a very 
cultural affection and very little religion. I, I am married to a non-Jew. I have raised my children to have bar and bat mitzvahs, but I've sort of also been like, and that's where we stop. Um, but I, I, I have a great love and affection for the ethnicity and for the cultural aspect of it, but yeah. the religious part never really, never really made an impact. That's very interesting that you, that you say that because I was, I thought that the article might've been more correct because I was going to ask you if John was Jewish and if not, how did you get yourself to marry somebody yeah. who wasn't Jewish? Because I'm mm-hmm. not religious at all. And I, I never got married, not just for that reason, but I couldn't live with it. I couldn't, I, I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I understand. Yeah, no, I, let me tell you something. I had very few Jewish boyfriends. I never, I, a lot of Jewish met friends, but n- my boyfriends were hardly ever Jewish. It was and just, I was never into it. <laughs> it's the same with me, but I've kind of, I didn't really go out that much because I didn't want to false lead, lead anybody to a false uh, conclusion that I was going to, oh, you're the one, you know? I get it. But, I do. I get it. Yeah, no. Um, and but it, the truth is, John is also he grew up in New York, mm-hmm. in the center of New York. Mm-hmm. And if you grow up in New York City, you're Jewish. So the good news is, is that <laughs> he gets true. he he completely understands the cultural significance and idiosyncrasies. It, interesting. Interesting. So now where does the comedy come from? Because you're a uh, comedy team member. You're, you have a comedy partner. I used to, I used used to, to. I used to. So, um, you know, I always loved improv comedy as a, as a fan, um, back in the, you know, late eighties, early nineties, I was the one watching whose line is it anyway, when from England, when they would rerun all the episodes. And so I was always fascinated with improv and stand up. Um, and then in college, I really didn't find my calling in terms of, profession. I, I, you know, I was very confused by the whole college thing. I didn't understand whether or not I was supposed to be looking for a vocation or an education or a mix of both. It all felt very, um, and then I, I sort of based what my college experience was supposed to be on from Revenge of the Nerds. So I was like, but Boston University <laughs> doesn't look like that. So I found it, I didn't, I don't think I had great guidance. I also did, wasn't asking the right questions. So college was a bit of a wash for me. It was at Boston University. Um, it's a good school for the right person, but for me, it was not. But the one thing that I found that I really liked there was the improv group. And that's where I wanted to spend all my time. And it's not that I didn't want to do straight theater or musical theater. I liked all of those things, but I, I mean, I used to say it's because I didn't want to work so hard that I had to memorize anything. Um, but I just generally found a joy in improv. I, I think that was just what clicked for me. What was interesting is when I graduated with a degree in communications, which at that time was not, it, it meant that I'd watched movies for four years. Um, I didn't quite know what that would translate into in the real world. What I learned was that there are many places to use improv as a profession that you would never ever think of. Um, cause I knew that's all I wanted to do, but I don't, I, how does that turn into a profession? You know, improv is a skill that is used in many other art forms, but also there are places to improvise. I wound up working at the first job I had when I graduated college was at the Renaissance festival, which I did not know what a Renaissance festival was. And there was no Google. I is thought I was doing, yeah. King Richard's fair. Then you're talking about, well, hilariously, I knew about King Richard's Fair. I didn't know King Richard's Fair was a Renaissance festival. I actually got hired for one that was much further away. So by the time I got there, I couldn't escape. It was in upstate New York. Um, I thought I wanted to do summer stock. I thought that would be a fun way to delay adulthood and work performing. But so I auditioned at what was then and probably is still called the New England Theater Conference auditions for all these little summer theaters. And I wasn't particularly good because I wasn't particularly trained, but I knew how to improv. So I got hired to do improv at this Renaissance festival from the brochure. I thought, oh, it's like Shakespeare in the park. Again, no Google. It is not Shakespeare in the park. It is something completely different. We all kind of know that now. But again, then I just did not know. I wound up going there for the summer and my head exploded because I was like, wait a minute, I'm dressing up as a renaissance character i'm interacting with people all day long i'm doing these different games and scenarios and whatever but it was improv 
you know, and I, I sort of was delighted by it because I was able to both make fun of it and respect it and treasure it. So that started me in one really weird direction. From there, I got hired to work at Walt Disney World. Um, they use a lot of improvisers in the parks. They're not exactly the most visible uh, entertainers. They're the people that host a lot of the shows, the live shows, the MCs. Um, and at the time they had a comedy theater at Disney world in Orlando that did a uh, short form theater, like what you'd see on whose line is it anyway. I eventually was working there full time. And by the time I was 24, I was like, "Uh Oh, I live in Orlando. That feels like a, maybe not where I want to live out my life. <laughs> And so I saved my money and I moved to New York City and I got to New York City. And it was one of those things where I truly had one phone number in my pocket. And it was for this guy who had some knowledge of improv stuff in both Florida and um, New York. And he said, yeah, you want to do this theater and this theater. And also there's this new group in town that they called the Upright Citizens Brigade. And I think they're pretty good. That was what became the UCB in the past two decades and has really taken over a lot of the great comedy um, theaters and spaces in our country and some of our major cities. But at the time, they were just four people who were teaching classes. And so I got involved with them. And that's a very long answer to how I got mixed up in comedy. But my uh, I did have a comedy team for a very long time, for about 12 years. We broke up about six years ago. Um very amicable, just different directions. 12 years is actually a hugely long run for a comedy team. Sure. Um, and that includes even the classic comedy teams. Um, and we, uh, I'm actually bringing my character back from that solo um, and starting to do work, play with her again. But yeah, it's been a, a, a good comedy run, led to a lot of other things. So I'm going to, I was going to save this until later, but I want to talk about American Princess, a series <laughs> for Amazon Prime that you created and you wrote the pilot. And when I was watching the pilot, I kept looking and looking. I knew it was your show. And I'm thinking, where is she? Why isn't she in it? She, I know she's an actress. Why didn't you put yourself in your own show? I was too old for the main character. Um, oh, that's so come sweet. On. Well, oh, it's, you know what? It's based on my story of winding up at the Renaissance Festival by accident, but we modernized the story. I always wanted to tell that story because I always thought, oh, this is Private Benjamin at the Renaissance Festival. For those of you who've never seen Private Benjamin, go rent it right now. But it's a Jewish American princess type character, Goldie Hawn, who winds up in the army. And to me, that was my experience at the Ren Fair because I had grown up in Swampscott, which is a tiny little seaside town that you know very well. Yes. And it is, it is very sheltered. It is, it is very, I, I always believed that the way to being a success in Swampscott meant that you were a doctor or a lawyer or an academic mm -hmm. or someone who, you know, the arts and I mean, I guess Leslie Stahl, right. She's the big famous person from Swampscott. Um, and but Miss, was, Miss Jean from Rob right. who just right. died. She just oh, died. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, but even, I mean, even with Leslie Stahl, I mean, that's serious journalism. So, or at least in my mind, it's serious people, you know, party clowns don't come from Swampscott. So I, it never occurred to me that um, I would wind up in a place as honestly, as silly as the Renaissance festival, which is a playground for grownups. It's very, yeah. very silly. It's dress yeah. up. And so when I got there, I just felt like the biggest square peg. I said, this can't be real. These can't be adults doing this. <laughs> um, now, listen, we're in a world where Comic-Con is the norm. But back then, it just would have, I mean, my parents came to visit me and I thought they were going to die. Um, so <laughs> I, um, I mean, the, but, but the, I just, to me, that was always just a great story as an adult learning to get in touch with their playful side and I always wanted to tell it and I finally got to make the show a few years ago and I really felt like the character had to be young enough and uh young enough and naive enough to make a mistake like this and to have never been to a renaissance festival and to really not know what one was mm -hmm. and at this point in this day and age to not know what a renaissance fair is like you kind of have to be a socialite or someone who's just living in an in a, a bubble of a different kind so we cast this wonderful actress, Georgia Flood, 
And um, she was this millennial who basically like walked out on her own wedding and winds up at what she thinks is a theme wedding in the country. And it turns out that it's a Renaissance festival. So um, yeah, I'm really proud of it. I'm, it. It was on the wrong network. Originally, it was for Lifetime, which was really weird. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, they kind of buried it because it was so different from what they were normally programming. Yeah. And now it's available on Amazon for $29.99. So yeah. anybody who wants to see it can enjoy it. It's 10 episodes, great binge, and then it's over. I was already on Amazon Prime, so it was only three ninety nine for me. Oh, that's great okay, for the whole for the whole series. Really? Yeah. Oh, good to know. Because I'm a member, you know. And awesome. Uh, so now I got to ask you this because I I I'm one of the nerds that likes to go to King Richard's Fair. The characters on your show uh, are they that bizarre in real life? They, I mean, yes. wow. That, yeah. that it's like a whole and they yeah. never come out of character like that they do the what behind the scenes they do behind yeah. the scenes they do people who work on the rent fair they're like circus performers yeah. you know what i mean so yeah. they really do live a, their lives behind the fences yeah it's a world of its own just like professional wrestling and the circus and all that stuff i don't know if you knew but i, I did a professional wrestling interview show called wrestling oh. talk for 31 years when yeah. I never made, never made a dime on it, but, uh, Oh my gosh. Yeah. But uh, that's, this is my passion. This show is what do you want to do about people who do their passion, do what they love doing. And you're probably the highest profile person that I've had so far because you <laughs> have created a series that's actually on a nationally syndicated, uh, venue. Yeah. How did I mean, this I... happen? Well, it happened, you know, I, the path, me wanting to tell that story started 25 years ago. So it's like, I wanted to tell that longer than that, actually, mm -hmm. almost 30 years ago. Um, and it, it, every time I moved into another area of this business, whether it was as an actor or as a writer or as an improv performer or an improv teacher, I would always have that story of the Ren Fair shock in the back of my mind. So over the years, I did a one woman show about the Renaissance Festival. I did, uh, I think I somewhere there's some terrible, really long screenplay that looks like a Christopher Guest type mockumentary version of it. And it's just one of those stories that I was, I talked about a lot. Um, it became part of my brand in a way. It's like, if I had a general meeting with a casting director or with a producer for a writing job or whatever, what else are you working on? Oh, I've always wanted to do a show about this thing. And, you know, it took almost 30 years or at the time, I guess almost 20 years. And the right producer was like, I think that might be really interesting. Like maybe we can try and get that made. At the time, it was with Jenji Cohan, who created Weeds and Orange is the New Black. Um, and she she was really, you know, I mean, the business part of it's so boring, but it's like, you know, she'd been working mostly at Netflix, and this was sort of her last project in the regular broadcast world. Um, and part of that is why nobody heard of it, because she was really transitional, and she really didn't want to be in broadcast anymore. So it's one of those things that just like got made, kind of got made the way I wanted to get it made because nobody knew it was really happening. It was kind of under the radar. So it's real and it exists and it's good. The last missing element would be, and people love it because they've seen it and they've heard of it. And that you really kind of need that part <laughs> for yeah. it to go on and on. But I was, I, because enough time has passed and I'm not sitting there like licking my wounds and being all sad that I don't get to make more. I really can look back and be like, oh, wow, I have this thing. I made 10 episodes. My kids are in it and they have grown so much than that since then. It's so weird. Wow. Um, they got to do an episode or two. Um, it's pretty cool, you know? So I, and now what the other thing that it has afforded me is the opportunity to work at a different level in this business. So even if people didn't see it, it exists, they can look it up, they know it's real. I have the credibility to do the kind of job that I'm doing now, which is that I work on Grey's Anatomy, which is incredibly weird because that's not a comedy. 
but it has comedic elements. Um, mm. But because of American Princess, I can work here and I know what I'm doing and I understand the landscape a little bit because even though there's some pretty heavy drama and soap opera elements of Grey's Anatomy, what I understand about it is the storytelling and I understand you know, the writing part that I have the experience having had. I also understand a lot of the production aspects. So that puts me at a higher level. So it's it, American princess was a net win net win. Sure. Yeah. I really like the fact that the comedy comes from the characters rather than a contrived type oh, yeah. of schlocky stuff. You know what I mean? It yeah. was so believable to me that actually be, when I started watching the pilot, I was so annoyed by the the bridesmaids. Oh yeah. When before the Renaissance fair came in, yep. I, I said to myself, "Oh my god, I'm going to hate this." Yeah. Because I hated them and yep. that was the intent. Yeah. You know, so it was the impetus for her to get out of there. It was great. It's great. It works perfectly, you know. I think my favorite episode is actually in the fourth episode when those bridesmaids come to visit her at the fair <laughs> because <laughs> they can't believe what is happening. So that's like the equivalent of when my friends from Swampscott all came to visit me at the Renaissance Festival and were very confused. Wow, that, that's yeah. interesting. Now, there's another Swampscott connection here. The executive producers of your show worked with Piper Kerman to create yes. uh, uh, Orange of is the course, New Black. Of course, Piper. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We are Facebook friends. I, I can't remember if we've actually met in person or not. But yes, she is another famous Swampscott. Yeah. Swampscott lady. And it's funny because yeah. she, in my cable studio in room 112 at Swampscott High, <laughs> Piper was our first uh, after school anchor person. That for makes our so new much show. sense. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, I think I may, I might even have the, the tape where we're miking her up and she says, I want to be a writer, you know. But little did she know she had to be a writer. She had to go to jail to succeed. That that's the, the the wildest story. I think the book is is, is incredible. If you've ever it's read, it's incredible. That I have read the book. In fact, I read the book when Genji was trying to figure out whether or not she wanted to develop it, because Genji and I knew each other uh, from comedy stuff because she loved this comedy act that I did, and mm -hmm. that's the other Swamp Scott sort of thing is that my character, um, Beverly was is from swamp scott in her mythology so mm -hmm. there's i've also i <laughs> yeah like it's just I, there's a lot of local reference in beverly to swamp scott haunts very interesting so swamp scott is always rearing its head somewhere and that was part one of my interview with jamie denbo the creator and producer and writer of american princess you can find it on amazon.com amazon prime and in part two, which is going to be next week, you will see a little cameo, an unintended one by John Ross Bowie, her husband, who was on the Big Bang Theory as Kripke. So look forward to that and more of Jamie herself and her story. And uh, we'll see what she's doing these days, aside from her regular stint as a writer on Grey's Anatomy. So join me again next time. And until then... What do you want to do?